Hello, good morning everyone. Good morning freshmen. Uh, this is your professor Andika Eltan speaking. I sincerely hope each and every one of you is um, doing well or doing well during this pandemic season. Um, I'm so glad that you have uh, still pursued your continuing education even during these times and I know it's hard both for you and for us, but we will do our best to learn from each other. So today we will be talking about the nucleus. Um, so first, we will describe what is the nucleus for. Okay, the nucleus is actually the cell's command center. So we know what a cell is. It is a group of organelles in cytoplasm uh, bound by a membrane. Um, within the cell is the nucleus. The nucleus actually contains the code for all the cell's enzymes and proteins. So we all know that cells function through proteins, uh, signaling proteins, structural proteins, um, constitutive proteins. Uh, all of these proteins are encoded in our DNA, which is located in our nucleus. So it, the nucleus is the command center, diba? Right? It's like an army base, no? Parang army base. The army base has a command center where all the outgoing instructions and incoming information are consolidated and processed. So, parang ganun din sa nucleus, no? Uh, it, is also, it also contains the molecular machinery for DNA replication, synthesis, and processing of RNA. So, we all know that DNA encodes our genes. Um, we are all made up of uh, proteins, um, and these proteins are synthesized from DNA signals or DNA DNA sequences. Um, the DNA sequences are located inside the nucleus. DNA is transcribed into RNA. RNA is sent out into our uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum for processing, where proteins are eventually made, sent to Golgi bodies and stuff. And they are released or they are used either within the cell or sent to the extracellular environment. Okay? So the components of the nucleus, there are three important components. Barring the nuclear pores, the three important components are the nuclear envelope, the chromatin, and the nucleolus. Okay? Nuclear envelope, chromatin, and nucleolus. So, usually the nucleus is located within uh, or in the, at the center of the cell. Now, usually it's at the center of the cell because it's the command center. Uh, it's bound by a nuclear envelope which protects it from um, certain uh, uh, cytoplasmic changes because, of course, uh, DNA is very precious. No, It cannot be... Uh, it should not be easily damaged or um, altered because, of course, once DNA is altered, um, there could be certain diseases that could arise from it, like, of course, cancer. Uh, you could also have um, genetic mutations that can, that can be passed on to the next generation and result in physical and cognitive um, impairments. Okay, so first, let us discuss these three important components of the nucleus. First, we go to the nuclear membrane. Okay, the nuclear membrane is a semi-permeable barrier between the nuclear and cytoplasmic compartments. So remember, within the cell, there are two compartments. You have the cytoplasm and the nucleus. There is a selectively permeable barrier between them, and that is the nuclear membrane. So why is it selectively permeable? What other selectively permeable barriers can we remember? I remember once in high school, we had an experiment, uh, yung itlog ng manok, no? the egg of the chicken is a selectively or a semi-permeable membrane. Um, we put it in a bucket full of salt and water, and voila, it turned out that naging salted egg siya after. So, Selectively permeable. Why is it selectively permeable? It lets ions and solutes, no, certain electrolytes, to freely pass between 
by diffusion between the, the cytoplasm and the nucleus. And that is how uh, the nucleus uh, is in equilibrium with the cytoplasm. But at the same time, it also regulates the passage of certain macromolecules. So of course, proteins, no, certain uh, signaling molecules are uh, regulated um, by this permeable barrier through the nuclear pore membranes. Okay, so as you can see in this um, electron microscope example, so this is the nucleus, no? These are the nuclear pores. So if you can see, this is the nuclear envelope. Um, of course, we know that the nucleus is contiguous with the endoplasmic reticulum. So if you can see these fine lines over here, these are the endoplasmic reticulum. This is the endoplasmic reticulum and this is the nuclear envelope. So this is a nuclear pore through which um, macromolecules, proteins, you know, can um, pass through. Okay, and you see the nucleolus here. It's very dense. It's very compact. Um, and it's very dark. So this is a cutout example. So if you can see the nuclear membrane, it's actually composed of an inner or inner membrane and an outer membrane. The inner membrane is next to the here. You can see. You have an outer nuclear membrane, which is continuous with the rough endoplasmic reticulum, okay, and an inner nuclear mem membrane closely associated with the nuclear lamina. They are both bridged at the nuclear pores. The nuclear pores. Uh, the nuclear pores are made of core proteins called nucleoporins, and they display an eightfold symmetry around a lumen, so thus forming a pore. Um, so as I've discussed earlier, these nuclear pores, they allow solutes, macromolecules to um, selectively enter and exit the nucleus. Nucleoporins, so like we discussed earlier, ions and solutes pass through the lumen by diffusion. And at the same time, these nucleoporins... They regulate the movement of macromolecules between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. Okay, so parang gate na may guard. Okay, so if ions and solutes, parang ID nila yon, they can pass freely by diffusion, depends on the concentration. But when it comes to macromolecules, so what are macromolecules? Like mga signaling proteins, no? um, enzymes, or... Uh, other molecules that are larger in size, um, they are being regulated. No? So ito, ribosomal units, transcription factors, RNA. So okay, so we're done with the nuclear membrane. So you, what you have to remember with the nuclear membrane is that you have an outer nuclear membrane, which is continuous with the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And you have an inner membrane, which is contiguous with the lamina. And what's important with the nuclear membrane is it has nuclear pores, okay, which are which are composed of proteins called nucleoporins. And it has a regulatory activity. So next is chromatin. What is chromatin? Chromatin. Basically, kasi maraming terms. Chromatin, chromatid, chromosome, no? DNA, genes. So it's chromatin. Chromatin consists of DNA all of its associated proteins involved in the organization and function of DNA. So it's not just DNA, it's DNA and all its associated proteins. In humans, each chromatin is divided into 46 chromosomes. So the chromatin, when it is packaged, it is called a chromosome. Okay, so basically parang ganun yun. When chromatin is packaged, it is called a chromosome. But when it is um, active no, in... in in cells that are not dividing in differentiated cells, some of the some of the genetic material or some of the DNA are being transcribed or um, being replicated in 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 preparation for division in cell division. So it is called chromatin. But when it is packaged, no chromosome. So parang ganon. So para madali tandaan. After DNA replica replication. But before cell division, each chromosome consists of two identical chromatin called chromatids. Okay, so remember in mitosis, in cell division, 
So each chromosome consists of two identical chromatin. No? So in humans, 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs. So in here you can see the DNA of each human cell. So what's important about chromatin is that the DNA of each human cell is about 2 meters long with 3.2 billion base pairs. Therefore, it must be extensively packaged within the nucleus. Imagine 2 meters long ang isang DNA. So how can you fit that into a cell? Right? Cells are microscopic. So if you fit 2 meters long of information, it must be extensively packaged. And how does the cell do this or how does the nucleus do this? It is organized around histones. Okay? Histones are structural units of the DNA and... Ah, sorry, structural unit of the DNA is, is a histone and the DNA package around it is called a nucleosome. So we have chromatin, which consists of DNA and all its associated proteins, all of its associated proteins involved in the organization and function. When the chromatins are, are, are packaged, they're called chromosomes. During replication of the DNA, but before cell division, each chromosome consists of two identical chromatin called chromatid, okay? But the most basic structural unit is called a nucleosome. It has core of eight histones around which is wrapped around 150 base pairs, okay? So how does the nucleus package the chromatin? They package it around, they organize it around histones. Each nucleosome also has a larger histone uh, associated with it. Nucleosomes are structurally dynamic. No? Histones, histone packaging allows for temporary wrapping and unwrapping of DNA. Okay, so imagine um, not all of our genes. Rem remember, I, I'm sure you've heard about epigenetics and um, the effect of our environment. So not all of our DNA is expressed in every cell, right? Some cells which are more differentiated, some parts of the DNA are expressed there because they need to make these uh, enzymes or these uh, proteins for their specific function. But not all our cells in our body have the same function. Like cells in the liver have a different function than blood cells or cells in our bones have different function than cells in our brain. So not all of the time, all of the genes are expressed. So sometimes, so what the DNA does is it packages itself around histones that allow for temporary wrapping and unwrapping of DNA depending on uh, the demands of the cell. So if a, so, for example, if um, you need to produce more, let's say, epinephrine, then the genes for the epinephrine will unwrap and the RNA will be transcribed so that more epinephrine can be made. And then if there is little need for epinephrine, then maybe the genes for the epinephrine will wrap back into, onto the histone. So that's just an example. Okay, Microscopically, there are two categories of chromatin. So you have euchromatin and heterochromatin. Okay, Euchromatin, of course, uniform heterochromatin, Okay, more dense, right? More uh, hetero means other. Okay, so this is a simple depiction. So as you can see here, um, inactive nuclear compartment, you can have non-transcribed euchromatin, which are these tiny strands of gray. Of course, transcribed euchromatin are more unpacked because the RNA molecules need to attach to the DNA molecules. And they need to be transcribed so that information can be uh, written on the RNA. For non-transcribed, so they are more coiled up. So there's practically no space for the RNA there. And of course, you have heterochromatin here. Okay, euchromatin, visible as finely dispersed granular material in the electron microscope and as lightly stained basophilic areas in the light microscope. So basophilic meaning they are color blue. Remember, heterochromatin appears as coarse electron dense material in the electron microscope and intensely basophilic clumps in the light microscope. So remember, basophilic means they are color blue. Um, on light microscopy, heterochromatin is more intensely stained with blue compared to euchromatin. Okay. So as you can see here, this is an example of an electron microscopy of the nucleus. 
So let us first um, identify the parts so that we don't forget. So this is the nuclear membrane, okay? These here are probably nuclear pores, if I'm not mistaken. These are probably a nuclear pores. Those are openings. So the white stuff here is actually the euchromatin. Okay, this, that's the euchromatin. And these densely packed areas, these darkly stained areas, these are heterochromatin. Okay, as you can see in this picture, they are more concentrated along the nuclear membrane. The heterochromatin is more concentrated along the nuclear membrane while the euchromatin is more widely dispersed. Of course, this here is the nucleolus. Nucleolus. Okay? So euchromatin has a more open structure. It is rich with genes, although not all genes are transcribed in all cells. Heterochromatin, on the other hand, is more dense and compact. There is little to no transcriptional, transcriptional activity and contains two types of genomic material. So one is constitutive. So when you say constitutive, usually it means that it is the same for all cells, no? It is found everywhere. It constitutes it is constitute it constitutes the whole body, so it's found everywhere. Generally similar in all cell types and contains mainly repetitive gene poor DNA sequences, including the large chromosomal regions called centromeres and telomeres. So the, later you will find out that telomeres actually give us longer lives. <laughs> so it, also we have facultative genomic material. These are the DNA with genes where transcription is variably inactivated in different cells by epigenetic mechanisms. Okay, so like I said earlier, not all genes are transcribed in all cells. And so sometimes there are facultative genes. Okay, so we will briefly discuss bar body. What is bar body? Um, facultative heterochromatin and small dense sex chromatin which is one of the two large X chromosomes present in human females. Of course, males, human males only have one X and one Y, whereas in females, you have one X and one another X. So the bar body is actually that part of the X chromosome that is sil silenced no, compared to the other. So the ratio of heterochromatin to euchromatin seen with nuclear staining can provide a rough indicator of a cell's metabolic and biosynthetic Activity. So as we discussed earlier, para madali tandaan, basta euchromatin, more transcriptionally active. Heterochromatin is a packed DNA, so it is not actively working, no? So cells with predominantly euchromatin, of course, let's say, for example, large neurons. Large neurons are always at work, okay? They always need to produce neurotransmitters, which are, uh, sometimes they are also proteins, no? So neurotransmitters... The neurotransmitter, the neurobiological um, chemistry in our brain and our nerves, of course, they change all the time depending on the demand of our body. So when we're asleep, we have we demand a different neurobiologic chemistry compared to when we are exercising. Okay, so neurons need to adapt to both of these situations, and therefore, um, the level of neurotransmitters that they produce are different for different activities, and thus. Um, different parts of the DNA are active you know, for for exercise and different parts are more active for, let's say, sleeping or um, when we are not working. Um, cells that have predominantly heterochromatin, like, for example, circulating lymphocytes, so they don't need a lot of uh, biosynthetic activity. Of course, we know that lymphocytes... Um, depending on the lymphocytes, but they are used for, of course, they are part of our immune system. Um, but uh, they don't have a lot of biosynthetic activity. Each pair of chromosomes originally derived from the mother and one from the father. So members of each pairs are called homologous. Homologous meaning they are the same. So how is it homologous even if one is from the mother and one is from the father? They're not necessarily identical. They're called homologous because they contain alleles of the same genes. So they contain the same form of the same genes, not necessarily identical, but the same form. Okay. So in a normal um, human, uh, our, our chromosomes are diploid. Remember, if you remember your biology, so they contain... Um, two pairs of each chromosome. So cells in most tissues, or what we call somatic cells, are referred to as 2N 
and the number of chromosomes. So in humans, 2 and 23, uh, which is diploid. Haploid, haploid is half the number of diploid um, number of chromosomes. For example, these are sperm cells and mature oocytes, or our gametes, our reproductive cells. No, so they contain half the genetic material because, of course, upon fertilization, half of the genetic material comes from the father and half of the genetic material comes from the mother. So that's why in sex cells or reproductive cells, um, they are haploid, half of the genetic material. But normally, we are diploid. So you have two sets of each chromatin or each chromosome, each genetic material. Okay, lastly, for the components of the nucleus, we have the nucleolus. The nucleus is basically a spherical, highly basophilic subdomain of nuclei in cells actively engaged in protein synthesis. Intense basophilia is due not to heterochromatin, but to the presence of densely concentrated ribosomal RNA that is transcribed, processed, and assembled into ribosomal subunits. So it's basically a very actively transcribing part of the nucleus. Before differentiation, cells undergo so we'll be so, or sorry. We will also briefly discuss the cell cycle because this is part of the uh, this is actually part of the chapter in your book. Um, I would encourage you to read on it. Um, we'll just run through the basic steps, but of course the details are in your book. Okay. So what is the cell cycle? The cell cycle is actually your body's way or the cells in our body. It's their way of reproducing. Okay. So before differentiation, cells undergo repeated cycles of macromolecular synthesis, growth, and, of course, division or mitosis. Okay, so synthesis and division. So these are, four, these are divided into four distinct phases. Of course, you have division, which is mitosis. You have G1 or GAP1. It is between mitosis and the beginning of DNA replication, which we will discuss later. later. This is also one of the most. Um, this is also one of the longest and uh, most heavily demanding on the cell. Of course, S is synthesis, where DNA is replicated, and G two is the gap between DNA duplication, DNA duplication, and the next mitosis. Okay, so we have cell division or mitosis. After that, the cells will, of course, deba. Right? For example, ikaw. Work ka, like, like divide, the banag like divide. Niman divide and tao. Pero, what I mean is, pag nag work ka, of course, there will be a period where you need to recuperate, no? Rejuvenate your resources. Kailangan, main ka, matulog, nan tubig, parang ganun yung G1. Okay, mitosis is the work. After the work, of course, yung cell, syempre nag divide siya, maliit yung cell ulit, no? Liliit siya, because na divide yung components. Of course, it has to work so that it will grow again before it can replicate its DNA, di ba? Um, so, parang ganun yung G1. Okay, so G1 is usually the longest and the most variable part of the cycle, referred to as the growth phase. So, as I said, in this phase, the cell volume is reduced by half during mitosis. And it is the stage where it returns to its previous size. So in cell, it will need to synthesize various enzymes. It will need to accumulate nutrients that are needed later on for DNA replication and cell division. So di ba parang bata, that's why yung mga bata, meron silang mga special uh, nutrient requirements because their bodies are rapidly growing and rapidly producing more and more cells. So they have a lot of uh, nutritional requirements like calcium, no vitamins, minerals for their bodies to be able to function or for their bodies to be able to accumulate much nutrients needed for their growth, of course, diba? Right? So union G1, growth phase. S is synthesis phase or DNA synthesis. S phase is characterized by replication of DNA. Histone synthesis, of course, remember, histone is how the nucleus packages the DNA and the beginning of centrosome duplication. So that's later on for mitosis. Genetic material of a cell is doubled before it enters mitosis, mitosis or meiosis, allow, allowing there to be enough DNA to be split into daughter cells. So mitosis, 
Cell division meiosis is how you make reproductive cells or gametes. G2. So G2 is the period of rapid cell growth and protein synthesis during which the cell prepares itself for mitosis. So parang papunta ng gera, no? Before you go to work again, which is mitosis, so of course you need to prepare. No, you need to get your gear, you need to get your bag, you need to get your boots, bullets for your arms, or something like that. So parang ganun yun. Um, before you work, or let's say if you're a uh, carpenter, then you have to get your hammer, you have to get your tools, di ba? For you to be able to work. So parang ganun yung G2. It's the preparatory phase for work again. And in some cells, there also, there's also what we call a G0. What? What is a G0? So it's a new post-mitotic cell which specializes and differentiates. So I'm sure you will discuss this in some other topic. But remember that diba, you have stem cells and you have progenitor cells. And then some cells are actually committed to being specialized and differentiated. And they don't, they don't uh, undergo mitosis anymore or temporarily halt their um, reproduct or uh, mitotic capability so that they can perform a specialized work. No? Uh, in some organs, like for example, the liver or the kidney, or uh, they, they, they can be recalled back to cell cycle, back to the cell cycle, back to cycling. But in some cells, they don't. No? So like for example, neurons or skeletal muscle, um, these are considered to be terminally differentiated. So, ito siya, G0, okay? So, what is cycling? So, di ba alam natin? G1, synthesis, G2, mitosis, and then you have G0 for post-mitotic cells which, which differentiate and specialize. So, what is cycling? No, Cycling is activated, like I said earlier, in post-mitotic G0 cells. So, these are um, mitigate, these are, are, are facilitated by proteins from the extracellular environment called mitogens or growth factors. They stimulate these cells and maintain them at the G1 or G1 between G1 and synthesis restriction point. So parang okay, nag grow siya to a certain point before it replicates DNA um, para maka continue siya with the cell cycle. Okay? Throughout the cell cycle, actually, there are a lot of restriction points or checkpoints controlled by proteins called cyclins. So we will later on um, no, or, uh, realize that these cyclins are actually sila, parang checkpoint na, no? parang police. No? So before ka makaproceed sa next stage, um, of course, you have to uh, pass the checkpoint first. No? So check dito yung mga DNA damage. There's damage to the DNA. No? If there are altered genes that might lead to uh, cellular destruction later on or uh, worse is malignant um, malignant unrestricted growth unrestricted uh, reproduction of the cell so dito sa checkpoints na to dito na check yun kung pwedeng mag reproduce ulit itong cell na ito or should we stop reproducing this cell and lead to apoptosis no So yan, ito yung mga checkpoints. As you can see, maraming checkpoints dyan. Okay. So this is a more detailed um, description of the checkpoint. So ito, for example, for the G1 to the S phase, or the, does the cell have enough nutrition? No, because like for example, like we discussed earlier, G1 is the growth phase where the cell accumulates enough nutrition for it to be able to grow to a substantial size before the DNA can replicate. So that when the cell divides, it already has enough mass in it so that it can survive on its own. It's all DNA intact. Okay, if it is, then the cell can prepare for DNA replication and enter the synthesis phase. So during the synthesis phase, it's like synthesize na yung DNA. Um, May ibang checkpoint na naman between G2 and bef before magmitosis. So, okay, na-replicate na lahat ng DNA. So, complete ba yung replication? No? Wala bang na-miss out? Wala bang nakalimutan isulat? Ng, ano, no? Wala bang na-miss na out? Or uh, probably wala bang nasobrahan? No? Complete ba yung replication? So, if yes, then it can undergo mitosis, of course. 
then meron na naman during the mitotic phase of course we'll discuss also later during the between metaphase and anaphase is all dna intact or all chromosomes attached to the mitotic spindle no wala bang naiwan na chromosome because if not the cell will of course it cannot survive no so ganun so ang galing no our bodies have a lot of mechanisms fail safe mechanisms so that uh, the cells to be produced for the next generation for that tissue for that organ um, they are complete and they can function properly. No? So mitosis is the only cell cycle phase that can be routinely distinguished with the light microscope. Uh, it is the period of cell division. Uh, of course, after mitosis, there is a long period which is called the interphase wherein there is no activity. No? And mitosis is divided into four phases. So you have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase or telophase. So it is a this is a uh, very good depiction. This is found in your book, you know. So prophase, as you can see, um, the chromosomes, the two sister chromatids are joined at the center. Then start ng magdevelop yung uh, spindle for the for the for the separation of the uh, DNA material during mitosis. Then you have uh, metaphase where there is the, the genes are the, the chromosomes are lined up in the center in the equatorial plate no para siguradong uh, pag nag split yung cell a eh, um, the DNA material will be distributed equally no between the two daughter cells. So you have anaphase, the sister chromatids are being pulled apart now. And of course, during the telophase, uh, there is reforming of the nuclear envelope. And of course, there's already a cleavage. So that the one, uh, one mother cell will produce two daughter cells with equal amount of genetic material, uh, each with its own molecular Machinery and command center, as we discussed earlier, which is the nucleus. And of course, to ensure that both daughter cells can survive and function properly. So during the prophase, the nucleolus disappears. Replicated chromatin condenses into chromosomes. No? So they're already packaged. So wala na, wala nang, ano, balik na sa box. No? Centrosomes migrate to opposite poles of the cell and organize microtubules. So this is, microtubules assist in the, in the, uh, mitotic process, no, by making sure that everything is organized. Later in prophase, the nuclear lamina and nuclear pores disassemble and disperse into cytoplasmic membrane vesicles. So then, na distribute na yung nuclear lamina, yung nuclear pores. Uh, it's made sure na dalawa sila meron, both daughter cells. So this is how it looks like on light microscopy: the nucleus with dispersed chromosomes. Okay, during the metaphase, chromosomes condense further. The cell is now more spherical and microtubules move into alignment at the equatorial plate. So, sa gitna na. So, this is how it looks. With the equatorial plate, if you can see, this is a very straight line right here. So, mitotic spindle on both sides. So, the furrow is actually already developing here. Okay, so during the anaphase, Sister chromatids are now called chromosomes themselves. They separate and move towards opposite sides of the spindle pole. So ito na, ayan na. Chromatids are being pulled apart. So meron ng gap between sa kanila, no? And lastly, during the telophase, two sets of chromosomes are at the spindle poles and begin reverting to their uncondensed state. So wala na, since naghiwalay na sila, okay. Pwede na ulit mag-unwind para makagawa na ulit ng bagong set ng mga growth factors, ng proteins, ng signaling molecules, enzymes within the cells, within the daughter cells themselves. Nuclear envelope begins to reassemble around each set of daughter chromosomes and a belt-like contractile ring of actin filaments associated with myosins develop in the cortical cytoplasm at the equator. So during cytokinesis, so pag move ng cells apart from each other at the end of telophase, the ring constricts, producing a cleavage and furrow and progresses until the cytoplasm and its organelles are divided into two daughter cells, each with one nucleus. No? So parang siya yung, uh, siya yung pumuputol sa cell membrane sa gitna. Okay? Para ma 
separate fully yung dalawang daughter cells, no? Hindi sila maging Siamese twins. So, ito na yun, cytokinesis, no? Movement of cells away from each other. So, if you can see here, so ito nga, like I said earlier, mitotic cells, uh, my, mitosis is the only part of the cell cycle which can be distinguished in light microscopy, remember? So, here you can see, ito, densely packaged, no? Nucleus. So, yan, mga mitotic activity. That's mitotic activity. This one, not so clear, but here, mitotic activity. So, mitotic cells are usually... Uh, difficult to identify conclusively, but may often be detected in rapidly growing tissues by their condensed chromatin. So, rapidly growing tissues, uh, naman natin, rapidly growing tissues like skin cells, no, the lining of the gastrointestinal tract, no, those are rapidly dividing tissue. So, doon maganda makita yung uh, mitotic activity. So, this is, in, this is a diagram from interphase to prophase, metaphase, and eventually to producing two daughter cells. So, of course, we'll also briefly discuss stem cells and tissue renewal because it's part of... Um, uh, this is a very important topic, especially when talking about DNA and um, the nucleus. No? So, stem cells and tissue renewal. Throughout an individual's lifetime, many tissues and organs contain a small population of undifferentiated stem cells whose cycling serves to renew the differentiated cells of tissues as needed. And our body does this through asymmetric division. No? So, di ba, remember, mitosis produces two daughter cells. No? Asymmetric division, one daughter cell leads to differentiation. So, magiging specialized cell siya. So, like, for example, in the liver, yung stem cells ng liver natin, hepatic stem cells, pwedeng yung isang daughter cell niya magiging hepatocyte. Pero yung isa mag-remain as a stem cell. So, this is best studied in tissue with rapidly renewing cell population, especially blood cells, skin, lining of the GI tract. Now, most mitotic cells are not actually stem cells, but more rapidly dividing progeny called progenitor cells. No? So, if you can see this picture on the side, it yung stem cell. Stem cell is very archaic, it's very undifferentiated. No? So, wala talaga siyang special function. Hindi siya nakakommit to any kind of differentiating cell. So, ang function niya lang talaga is mag-reproduce. No? So, wala, halos wala siyang ibang ginawa kundi mag-reproduce. No? Now, kapag nagkaroon ng isang stem cell na magiging mag-commit to becoming a progenitor cell, usually, ito na yung cell na nagdi-divide into um, magiging differentiated cell na talaga siya. Like, for example, yun nga, lining of the GI tract, no? Or skin. So, from the stem cell, divides into two. One remains as a stem cell. And this other one becomes committed to differentiation. Okay? So, what about meiosis? So, this is a specialized process involving two unique, two unique and closely associated cell divisions. This occurs only in cells that will form sperm and egg. So, it only happens in cells which produce gametes or reproductive cells. No? So, it has two key features. So, number one, the homologous chromosomes of each pair. Remember, one comes from the father and one comes from the mother. Why are they homologous? Because they contain alleles of the same gene. So, no, they're not necessarily identical. They're just homologs. They are the same form of the same gene. They come together in an activity termed synapsis, no? Synapse, so dumidikit. Dumidikit sila. Wherein, double-stranded breaks and repairs occur in the DNA, some of which result in reciprocal DNA change exchanges called crossovers between the aligned homologous chromosomes. So, nangyayari, basically, dalawang chromosome, yung homologs, pagdikit nila, mag-exchange sila ng genetic information. No? Nag-crossover. This produces new combination of genes in the chromosome so that if any chromosomes in the germs, so that few, if any chromosomes in the germ cells are exactly the same as those in the mother or the father. So, diba, for example, ikaw, you have a mother and your father. Pag panganak sa'yo, wala ka namang, usually, may makukuha kang features from your mother, meron ka rin makukuha features from your father. You might get your height from your father and the shape of your nose from your mother or the color of your eyes from your mother, no? 
the color of your skin from your father because during synapses or they sorry that's because of the reproductive process pala which i mean like for example yung father mo uh hindi naman exactly the same lahat na makukuha mo from your lolo or your lola no because during synapses nag-exchange ng DNA nag-exchange ng so hindi magiging consistent ni porket ganito yung lahi nyo sa from your grandfather ganun na din sa yo um because of uh because of meiosis because of synapses no and the cells produced are haploid at the end of meiosis the cells produced are haploid so remember in mitosis for those of you not familiar in mitosis of course the end product the end the daughter cells are still diploid so dalawang set pa rin 23 pairs pa rin ng chromosomes nila okay but in meiosis ang sperm and egg cell that are produced are haploid so half na lang ng genetic material ang natitira sa kanila so this is a diagram of meiosis so in prophase 1 so you have crossing oh sorry you have crossing over paired chromosomes condensed in metaphase 1 homologous chromosomes line up double file still the same as before in anaphase 1 homologs separate into haploid daughter cells no and sister chromatids remain joined and in metaphase 2 chromosomes line up in single file and haploid cells so pagdating ng end product haploid na lang with new genetic combination so this is what i am talking about so dito blue and red naghalo sila some of the red material got transferred to the blue one and some of the blue material got transferred to the red one so magkaiba na yung combination ng genes no that's why sa successive generations ng human family hindi pare-pareho lahat ng itsura because aside from inheriting two different sets of genes yung sets of genes din from your father is combination na rin or nag nagpalit-palit na rin yung genes ng lolo and lola mo doon no so to ensure na meron ka makukuha sa lolo mo meron ka ring makukuha sa lola mo na side so in mitosis versus meiosis in summary my, meiosis and mitosis share many aspects of chromatin condensation and separation but differ in key ways so mitosis is a cell division that produces two diploid cells whereas meiosis involves divisions that produce four haploid cells so during meiotic crossover new combination of genes are produced and every haploid cell is genetically unique so this is also this also ensures like for example kayo magkapatid hindi kayo magkamukha lahat or hindi kayo pare-pareho ng identical because during meiosis no yung combination ng genes sa loob ng uh, genetic pool from your dad nag-iiba-iba yung sa mom mo rin nag-iiba-iba rin so different combinations of genes and i think we're already almost at the finish line so apoptosis what is apoptosis no it is falling off or the process of cell suicide or cell death no parang nagpapakamatay yung cell why is it happening um a lot of reasons but one is usually it's due to the cell is not anymore fit for reproduction no so either masyado ng maraming dna ang nagmutate or there's not enough resources for the cell to be able to continue its life cycle no and importantly apoptosis is not to be confused with necrosis which is death of all or most of the cells in an organ or tissue due to disease injury or failure of blood supply so apoptosis is not due to disease injury or failure of blood supply it is a highly regulated cellular activity that shrinks and eliminates defective and unneeded cells so like for like i said shadow ng maraming dna defects dna mutations or unneeded na siya so um, di na kailangan, di mo na ginagamit yung masyado. For example, di ba, after mo mag matagal hindi mag, ano, mag exercise, lumiliit yung muscle. So, ganun din, no? So, unneeded cells are eliminated because they consume energy without function, without uh, contributing anything. So, this results in a small membrane enclosed apoptotic body which quickly undergo phagocytosis by neighboring cells or cells with specialized. Uh, or specialized for debris removal. So, apoptotic cells do not release cellular components. So remember, 
they result in small membrane enclosed apoptotic bodies. So, so yung cellular components nila hindi na release sa extracellular environment. They do not release their organelles and other uh, broken down tissues into the cell extracellular environment and thus they do not incite an inflammatory reaction. No? So they are still enclosed in their cell membranes when they die. It is controlled by cytoplasmic proteins in the BCL2 family, so which triggers the death-promoting factors from the mitochondria. No? So, features of apoptosis. So, ano ba yung mga features? Paano nangyayari? So, once there is, once um, the cell uh, decided, decides na, okay, I cannot replicate anymore because there's already too much DNA defect, there's already uh, lack of resources, I'm not needed anymore. What happens? So there's loss of mitochondrial function and caspase activation. So like I said, BCL2 family, cytoplasmic, cytoplasmic proteins, itong BCL2, okay? So they come from the cytoplasm. They associate with themselves with the outer mitochondrial membrane, which compromises the integrity of the mitochondria. Once this happens, cytochrome C from the mitochondria is released into the cytoplasm. Cytochrome C activates proteolytic enzymes known as caspases. Okay? This results in protein degradation throughout the cell and this leads to fragmentation of the DNA induced by endonucleases. No? So, so, so cytoplasm, BCL2 proteins associate themselves with mitochondria. No? Pag nag-associate sila doon, nasisira yung integrity ng mitochondrial membrane it releases cytochrome C, which activates caspases. So yung caspases, they are proteolytic enzymes. So they dissolve, they digest the protein within the cell. This results in protein degradation throughout the cell. So buong cell, no? Sisira lahat ng proteins. So DNA naman, sa loob ng nucleus, and the nucleases, they cleave the DNA. So sinisira nila yung mga DNA. Of course, there's shrinkage of nuclear and cell volume. So like we discussed, nagiging small apoptotic bodies sila. No? There's destruction of the cyto cytoskeleton. So of course, imagine mo yung cytoskeleton which uh, helps maintain the shape of the cell. No? It, diba? Yung skeleton natin, parang ganun. It helps maintain the shape of our body. Of course, may broken bone ka, diba? So yung cytoskeleton and chromatin, nasisira na rin. So the, shells, the cells shrink. The nuclei becomes pycnotic, which means it becomes dense and darkly stained. So it's called a pycnotic nuclei. Of course, there are changes in cell membrane, diba? So pag nasira na yung cytoskeleton, kakaroon ng blebbing, membrane proteins are degraded, and lipid mobility increases. So remember, your by phospholipid bilayer, um, some of the proteins there, they actually help keep the stability. So pag nangyari, nagkakaroon ng imbalance, nasira yung cytoskeleton, nagkakaroon ng imbalance yung membrane proteins, nag-increase yung mobility ng uh, phospholipid bilayer. Formation and phagocytic removal. So of course, like we discussed, membrane-bound remnants of the cytoplasm and nucleus separate as small apoptotic bodies. And they are either phagocytosed by phagocytosed by surrounding cells, neighboring cells, or cells that are specialized for debris removal. Okay? So let's move on to medical application. How, how can, can we use this information? No? So one very important use of transcription factors is actually yung uh, GCSF in immunocompromised patients and erythropoietin, which uh, stimulates red blood cell production in patients with anemia. So like we discussed earlier, remember in the cell cycle, um, there are um, genes responsible for checking the DNA, um, and each of these checkpoints are actually regulated also by growth factors. No? So sometimes when you reach certain points in the cell cycle, uh, we, uh, the cell needs uh, certain proteins, no, which are growth factors, for them to be able to proceed within the cell cycle, proceed to the next phase of the cell, cell cycle. So for example, in red blood cells, you have erythropoietin. And in white blood cells, you have GCSF. So granulocyte colony stimulating factor, very um, important breakthrough, especially in uh, treatment, uh, in chemotherapy treatment, no? Because in chemotherapy treatment, uh, of course, we all know that some chemotherapeutic drugs 
they kill not just the cancer, the malignant, fast-growing cancer cells, but also the fast-growing cells in our body. And one of the fast-growing cells in our bodies located in our immune system, right? In our uh, marrows, in our bone marrow. So uh, GCSF um, greatly increases the immunocompetence of patients undergoing chemotherapy. No? So we have a chop, chop therapy. So ito na, kasira siya ng white blood cells. No? So before, they have CHOP45 regimen. So to give means 45 days um, difference between sessions. This allows for recovery of the immune system. But now they already have CHOP21, I think, which only allows three weeks between sessions. Because they give a granulocyte colony stimulating factor, which greatly increases the chance that our immune system can recover and at the same time, shortening the interval between treatments for, for the chemotherapeutic drugs to maximize their effect on the cancer cells. Okay? And then for erythropoietin, this is very instrumental, especially in patients with chronic kidney disease because erythropoietin um, uh, stimulates red blood cells and some of the red blood cell factors, erythropoietin, comes from kidneys, so if there's chronic kidney disease, no supplemental erythropoietin, nagiging anemic yung patients. So, erythropoietin helps na kahit may chronic kidney disease, mataas pa rin yung uh, weak, uh, the, the blood supply is not compromised because of um, poor RBC production. Then, um, we'll also Talk about proto-oncogenes. What are proto-oncogenes? Many genes coding for proteins important in the control of cell proliferation and differentiation are often called proto-oncogenes. No? But once they mutate, they're already called oncogenes. So, nagiging oncogenes na sila, oncogenic na. So, they stimulate. Uh, once their structure and function are compromised, they can lead to uncontrolled cell growth. No? So, ito na yung nagiging cancer na sila. So, proto-oncogenes are not bad. They are a normal part of the cell cycle. So you can, they control proteins important for proliferation. But they have to be in check, of course, from what we call tumor suppressor genes. I don't think I included that in my lecture, but there should be a balance. No? Proto-oncogenes, there are also tumor suppressor genes. These proto-oncogenes, proto once they mutate, they become oncogenes. So nagiging uncontrolled ng cell growth. Uh, example are HER2. So I'm, I'm, I don't know if you've heard of this, but this is very important in breast cancer. No? Protein receptors that are involved in growth and division of cells in the breast. So meron tayong drug for this. It's called Herceptin, targeted drug. So in breast cancer patients, or actually kahit na hindi ka pa breast cancer patient, pero if you have a very um, strong family history of breast cancer, you can get tested for HER2 new, which is the proto-oncogene and uh, ito yung tinatarget ng drug na trastuzumab or Herceptin. No? In breast cancer patients, kapag HER2 new positive, so you can give trastuzumab or Herceptin. Then we also have RAS. So RAS is actually the first proto-oncogene to be shown to turn into an oncogene. So this is very common in pancreatic cancers, no? gastrointestinal tract cancers, lung cancers. Unfortunately, this is termed undruggable. So, wala pang drug na developed for RAS, no? Wala pang treatment for RAS. Uh, I've read a few articles lately, um, two-year-old articles, na they have recent success, but still, until now, there's still no drug for RAS. Lastly, so I'm sure you know this, no? This is what you notice about this child. So, he has almond-shaped eyes that slant upward, no? Flattened face. Uh, his tongue is sticking out, so it's relatively big. Um, then, as you can see in his karyotype, so two chromosomes each no? pair, but for the 21, 21st chromosome, he has three pair. He has three chromosomes there. So this is termed trisomy 21. No, remember we are all all our cells are supposed to be diploid, only two pairs of only two copies of each chromosome. But in Down syndrome or trisomy 21, because the chromosome 21 is very small and one of the most likely to be overlooked at metaphase, anaphase, checkpoint, there could be non-disjunction. So remember, 
uh, in meiosis nagkakaroon ng synapses no dumidikit minsan hindi natatanggal so nagkakaroon ng non disjunction so it can lead to trisomy 21 this is a gamete carrying a double copy of trisomy 20 of chromosome 21 rather which forms a viable offspring so nabubuhay pa rin but with morphologic and cognitive cognitive impairments such as short neck flattened face almond eyes that slant up low set ears small hands and feet no marami pang iba depending on the amount of information from chromosome 22 that was carried over to the resulting gamete so um there are also trisomies that are called uh, mosaic so hindi kompleto hindi buong chromosome 21 ang na, na carry over no so yung mga very important medical applications so that's all class i encourage you to read your book uh, we'll have a post lecture exam uh, after your laboratory uh, short 20 item quiz lang so I encourage you to study your free time. Thank you for listening and um, God bless all of you.